Hello and welcome to today's episode where it's quite different as I'm pretty much having a one-to-one -one interview with my guest on the journey to motherhood. For some, it's smooth. For some, it's very rocky. My guest today is an amazing woman who has seen it all, been there, tried most, if not all options out there to motherhood. As we know, science and media has made some alternative routes to motherhood much more easier, and especially for the Black African woman. Join me as I have a talk down memory lane with my guest, Uche Ajemba, who is a serial entrepreneur, a strategist, a leader, and I'll probably just say she's a multifaceted woman. Thank you so much, Uche, for joining me on today's episode. I think it's fair to say that you are a one strong and determined woman. And so today I'm hoping that some of our viewers, if not all our viewers tuned in will be encouraged after listening to you as a young girl I think we should start with you being a young girl I guess the question because you know at what point in your marriage did you feel like something doesn't quite feel right something just doesn't feel right so I got married in 2010 so fast forward to 2014 I believe we went on holiday to Cape Town and while I was in the hotel room in Cape Town, I just remembered that um, I would hear, I always used to hear about medical tourism that oh, in Africa, that Cape Town had the best medical facilities um, mm -hmm. in, comparable to anywhere else in the world. So I said, okay, do you know what? I'm no longer on the NHS um, because I, I didn't live in England anymore. Um, and I'm here in Cape Town. Why don't I just run tests here and be sure that what they are telling me in Nigeria is correct? So... I called a friend of mine and I'm like, oh, um, I'm, in, in, I'm in Cape Town. Um, do you know, do you have friends um, in Cape Town that can you know, recommend or refer me to a hospital, a good hospital to go to? Um, and he said, okay, yes, I'm going to give you a name and a number. And he did that. So um, I got a name and a number and then the person referred me to this hospital. Now, before he actually did, I'd already done some research and that, the name of that hospital came up. So when, he, when I got the name, I thought, okay, perfect. I'm in good company. So I convinced my husband and I said, look, let's go. And he said, look, we're on holiday. Why are we doing this? I was like, let's just go. We are here. It doesn't make sense to be here and not try. So let's just go. So off we went to this, you know, gynecologist. Um, and we got there and she said, oh, okay. So lie, lie down. Let me examine you. And um, she goes, let me find where your fibroid is. Mm -hmm. And I said, to her, that's, a, that's an assumption. Exactly. I said to her categorically, I do not have a fibroid because remember I had done tests and none of that had come up before. Right. And I'm one of those people that even when I put on weight, my tummy is still flat. So I'm like, I do not have fibroid. She said to me, really? We'll see about that. Every African woman that comes in here has a fibroid. Hmm. And I said, okay. And she goes one, two, three. Oh, voila. Here's your fibroid. And Literally, I, I, to be honest, I still believe that the fiber literally appeared at that moment because prior to that time, mm. it hadn't come up. And, and so it, it, it sort of leads me to something I always tell people. You've got to be careful what you allow people to proclaim over you. You've got to be careful mm. the words that you allow in your space and in your environment. You know, it's regardless of your fate, you've got to be careful because I did not have, a, as far as I'm concerned, I stand by my word. I did not have a fiber prior to that time. And so you can imagine, and she says to me, oh, but don't worry about it. It's pretty small. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, a, I'm going to do a hysteroscopy so that I can be sure that it's not in any sensitive areas. But it seems really small, so don't worry about it. And so what was supposed to be this absolutely lovely, lovely holiday in a beautiful city like Cape Town, because this was my first time there, now became a medical trip. So the, mm -hmm. very, next, the very next day, we had to go back in for hysteroscopy. Of course, at this point, after my experience with the HSG, I wasn't, allow, I wasn't about to let anyone touch me again without finding out what I was, you know, about to undergo. And then- Because all of, all of, yeah, because all of these processes are quite, they're very intrusive, aren't they? they are, that's the word. They are very intrusive. It's not like someone just touching your tummy. People are actually putting things and poking you and all sorts of crazy things, right? And I'm like, you know, this is me. I'm looking at myself and saying, I don't understand. I mean- at the time, I was about I was about thirty five, and as far as I was concerned, I felt like I was twenty five, and I was thinking, "What am I doing? Like, I don't understand what's going on here." Anyway, I came back in, and obviously, I'd read up about it, and she said, "Oh, we're going to sedate you," and I'm like, "Sedate me? Like, this is supposed to be a holiday? What am I?" Mm. 
I got, I, but I had to do it because I'd already started the process and I needed to leave there knowing that everything was fine. So I agreed to the procedure. Um, of course it wasn't cheap, right? So, but that, at that point in time, that wasn't even the priority. We just thought, okay, we're here, we started this process, let's see through to the end. And so I did the hysteroscopy and then came back up and she says, oh, everything is fine. Or was it a laparoscopy? I keep getting them mixed up. Um, anyway, she goes, oh, everything's fine. It's very small, just like I had expected. Don't worry about it. Um, it's, don't let anyone touch the fibroid. It's, it's not that big and it shouldn't be a reason for you not to have a child. And that was the, literally, that was the end of my holiday because for the remaining days in Cape Town, I was very miserable. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do nothing. I just, I just wanted to just lie down on my bed, eat, and I just, I was just miserable. And, and I do thought, nothing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and th- thanks for sharing that with Shay. I mean, that, that must have been a quite traumatic experience for you from going to a very, what should have been a um, lovely holiday to, I guess, rather traumatic one. And I suppose um, fast forward to where we sort of were, I guess, a couple of years later, where she said to you, don't worry about it. The fibroids is nothing. It's not. Did you then experience over the years um, the fibroid becoming sort of an hindrance to you, to you conceiving? That's a very good question, because the answer to that is no. So just like she she said, the fibroid never became an issue. Um It got slightly bigger because I started to check, obviously. It got slightly bigger, but the doctors in Nigeria said the same thing. It's small. It's about four or five of them, but it's not a big deal. Leave it alone. It's not, I don't believe it's the reason why you've not been able to have kids. Um, My husband had also, at this point, had also done some tests as well. And there there wasn't anything that was a major concern, really. Nothing that was, Mm. you know, out of the ordinary for someone of his age. And... Mm. But then after three failed procedures. When you say three failed procedures, what do you mean by three failed procedures? Okay. So at this point, right, I now obviously they start to tell you, oh, once you're over 35 and you get pregnant, you become high risk. You know, the older you get, the chances of getting pregnant, you know, reduces. And even when you get pregnant, you know, you're going to have issues. It might be difficult and all sorts of, you know, just all sorts of scary things medically. So, of course, at this point, I started to panic, right? And I thought, okay, you can't just sit around here and not do anything. Now, truth be told, I, I wasn't so bothered by the fact that I didn't have children yet because my family, my husband's family, my husband, everyone was pretty nice and great and we're just not wired that way. But, you know, you know when you have a sense of responsibility that, listen, you'll be married. You're married... Mm. You are over 35. You've been married for about five years at this, this time. You can't just sit around and do nothing. In the spirit of let it be said that you have done something, you have made an effort. I said, okay, let me try IVF. And so I went the IVF route. Went back to Cape Town to the same woman. And she said, okay, that's fine. This is what we need to do. We're going to run this test and that test and da, 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 and just rule out everything that is wrong. Now, let me tell you something. My husband is not a typical African man in terms of his ideologies, but he just did not like the concept of IVF. And he would say to me, mm. no one is bothering you. I'm not bothering you, so nobody, so nobody can bother you. The, the tests have shown that there's nothing wrong with the two of us. Can you just chill and just enjoy yourself? And I, and I would say to him, it's easy for you to say that, right? If I eventually get pregnant when, I'm, when it's much later, I'm not going to be as agile as I am now. I'm not going to have the same kind of energy. I don't want to be 50 or 40 and have a one-year-old. So I need to at least make an effort. Mm. So he said, okay, I'll humor you. Now, I remember the day before we were to fly to Cape Town, he said to me, you're not doing that IVF. And I was really angry. And I said to him, what do you mean by not doing that IVF? At this point, I've taken two weeks of the injections, the booster injections, right? So that your eggs can overproduce for them to harvest for the IVF process. So I said to him, Mm -hmm. and then why did you let me take all the injections if you knew we were not going to do it? And he said, I told you, but you insisted. He said, I said, said, okay, but tickets have been bought. Hotel accommodation has been paid for. um, Everything is done. He said, that's fine. We can go on holiday and come back. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do anything. And I insisted, I insisted. 
So we got to Cape Town. We did the IVF. But right there on the day of the IVF, I knew immediately that it had failed. I just mm. knew. And I knew because we were not aligned. Right? We were not aligned. Mm. Mm. You, you, can't, you can't get very far in anything, any partnership, right? Let alone marriage. Both of you are not aligned. You don't have the same vision. You're not seeing the same endpoints. So I just knew at that moment that IVF had not failed. Um, mm. Anyway, did the IVF, flew back to Nigeria, um, and I think about five days in, I just it just fell apart. Mm, what an experience. Um, thanks for sharing that. So just a quick question. Um, how would you or what would you say are the tips um, that I guess couples need to follow to align themselves because you did say some really profound words that you can't um, get far in every relationship if both parties aren't aligned um, what would you say what would your recommendations be one of the things that I did was um, information information knowledge research is very very critical many times people resist things because they don't understand it right and, and I know that's what my husband always used to say he always used to say to me I don't understand these things that you come up with because they, I don't know anyone who's done them. They don't make sense to me. I, on the other hand, knew quite a few people and I don't know, done a lot of research. So you, you can't beat the person on the head with the information, but you've got to find a way and the right moments to share the information in a way that it's received in small bits, also referencing other people that you know who have gone through the journey because when it starts to see you know he or she starts to see people like them you know people that they like people that they hang out with people that they respect people that they know and they see that they were able to explore these options right then it becomes an easier conversation to have now I remember the first mm -hmm. time I broached the subject of surrogacy to my husband and he said to me um he said I want to know who your new friends are so I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, so you're trying to tell me, in fact, he said, so you're trying to tell me that somebody else will take my baby and she'll be carrying the baby, right? And then at the end of the period, she will hand the baby back to us. He now, <laughs> he now, he now said, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're really talking the real focus of our conversation my conversation with yourself Uche is really to create awareness for women out there that there are definitely multiple options of course we all want to we all want a natural conception but reality is that that may not be the journey I route for everyone and whilst waiting and whilst hoping and whilst staying in the place of hope and faith we can and, and I guess this, the conversation is we it is okay for us to explore other options that are available to us and I guess for you um, obviously going through three field IVF it was like what is the point I mean what, what was going through your mind and your husband at the time, uh, considering that you've had three fields that probably cost thousands, tens of thousands of, um, of pounds? By the third field IVF, I think I was just completely numb because that particular one, I was so sure that this time around it was going to be successful because it actually failed on the 14th day, on the last day. I was so sure that this time around, and I just thought, look, this just doesn't make any sense. And remember, clinically, there was absolutely nothing wrong with either nothing of us wrong. from the reports that we had seen. Well, at least nothing that was, you know, enough to bother anyone to the point of thinking, oh, you guys have issues. But the reason why they recommending IVF was like, listen, it's not happening naturally and you're not getting any younger, so you might as well try this. But then the doctor called my husband in. I remember um, a few days afterwards and said to him, listen, mm -hmm. I'm not happy that this IVF failed because I was very sure that this is going to go through. So can you maybe ask? her if she's willing to do um surgery to have the fibroids removed i went ballistic mm. like don't forget that i still have this woman's voice ringing in my ear you know i was still like listen i, ne I should never have had a fibroid in the first instance i still have this woman's voice ringing in my ear don't take this fibroid out and so i said i'll think about it after i got upset i calmed down i said i'll think about it and i thought about it for a year and a half <laughs> now I'm the girl who the only sickness that I ever, it's not even a sickness. The only thing that I, that ever happens to me is a headache. Like I don't have a doctor. I don't have a file in any hospital or at least 
up until this point. I, Prior I don't, to that I don't time. have a child in any hospital. I don't have a need to go to hospital. There's, I'm always in good health. The most that would happen is I would have a headache and I'll go to bed and I'm fine or just pop some painkillers and I'm good. So all of this was just unnecessary as far as I was concerned. I just, and then I used to say that, look, if the doctors would even say to me that this is what they've seen as the problem, then I, maybe I'll be able to handle it a bit better. But that didn't happen. So anyway, fast forward to that. I did the surgery. I did the fibroid surgery and nothing still happened. Now, the reason why this is important in the context of our conversation is because there are going to be people who have cases like me, unexplained infertility, right? Um, and what do you do? It's unexplained. It's not happening. And you want to have children. So it's different if you don't want to have children. You want to have children. What do you do? Are you going to just fold your arms and do nothing? And I'm also aware that there are some, you know, religious or faith-based um, um, ideologies that also prevent people from trying alternative routes to motherhood. So this is not, you know, me saying to you that, oh, this is the way to go or this is the way not to go. But I personally, you know, believe that no woman should have to wait. No woman should have to wait this long. No woman should have to wait that long, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, as long as she, you want children. And this is not you trying to play God or anything, but this is you exploring all the options to motherhood that exists. And there are quite a few of them out there. And you're absolutely right. Thank you so much for sort of moving our conversation to that, that uh, to sort of the options that are available. And of course, throughout this whole trying, you know, trying the IVF and you were still trying naturally and you were also considering other options. Can you talk us through the journey of these many other options? So I'm going to just talk generally about all the different options available. So there is IVF, obviously. Um, I'm not going to go into the medical details because I'm not a doctor, even though I know quite a bit about it now, you know, because I've had to do a lot of research. Um, but in summary, IVF basically, you know, you take the egg and the sperm and you fertilize it outside of the body and then you put it back into the woman and then hope it implants. And then if it does, she gets pregnant, carries the baby to term and everyone is happy. There is also um, surrogacy, which is now starting to become accepted in Nigeria, I don't know about the rest of Africa, because prior to now, remember I told you that I don't remember any of my friends, my parents' friends dealing with infertility. So it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a dining table conversation. It wasn't something that you sat with a group of people and you guys are talking about it. I'd never had anyone, I don't remember, you know, I still think today, I still try to see, okay, was there someone in, you know, in the family of friends that my, you know, my, the friends that my parents had or in the family who struggled with having children. And I don't remember mm. any. Mm. So um, it's something that people don't like to talk about, especially in places like Nigeria or in developing countries. But the good thing is that now people are starting to talk about it. So surrogacy is also an option. And obviously that's basically, uh, maybe there's been, it's been established that you're unable to carry your own child. You know, you're able to carry um, um, the child to full term for whatever reasons. Um, and so you then have a surrogate, right? Which is basically another woman who has um, been able to have children so the same IVF process would happen. They'll take the egg, they'll take the sperm, um, fertilize it, and then she'll become the carrier. But then you have contracts that are signed between both parties. So when she has the child, she will have the ch hand the child over to you. She's only a carrier. She's not the mother of that child. Was surrogacy one of the options you considered during that phase of trying? Of course it was. At this point, right, at this point. So all of this now was like from year six or so. I was going to consider everything that was legal, <laughs> everything, mm -hmm. everything that was medically possible and everything that was legal, I was going to consider it. Mm. So I had conversations about, you know, even alternative um, additional rounds of IVF. I had conversations about doing it in India. I had conversations about, you know, literally every country in the world I had conversations about surrogacy. I actually had two people who are close to me who called me one day and said to me, if you decide to go the surrogacy route, I will be your surrogate. I could, mm. not, I could not believe it. And let me put it in context. The two of them were married and had children. And I said to them, you're going to sacrifice nine months of your life carrying a baby that is not yours. And maybe another one year trying to recover from the pregnancy, losing all the baby fat mm. for me. And they said, yes, we'll do it for you. 
All you need to do is just say the word and it's a done deal. Two people. And every time I would, you know, months would go by and they would remind me again and said, if you decide to do it, I'm here for you. I will do the surrogacy for you. In fact, one of them wanted an additional child. And she said to me, because of you, I'm going to end now so that that final space is for you. And, mm. and this is important because you just never know who is in your network that is willing to make that sacrifice for you. Yeah. If you decide that that's a route Absol- that is, absolutely. It, it's an option Ab- for you. Absolutely. So another option that is, you know, available to, you know, anyone who's waiting, every, any family who's waiting is adoption. Now, they are, I don't know the statistics on the number of, you know, young girls or women who get pregnant and they don't want the children and they, they leave the children at a home at an orphanage or sometimes on the street. And these children are there and if no one takes them, they just basically stay there and they don't necessarily get the best of care because maybe the home has, what, 50 or, you know, 20 other children. So adoption is also at, um, an option that we all, we considered. We considered that ad- ad- I've I always wanted to adopt, actually. I always wanted to adopt from when I was a young girl because one of my mom's friends growing up um, I, um, had, ado- I think she had about two adopted children and she had her own biological children. And you never know the difference. You never know the difference, which is exactly how it should be. But I think I was just surprised that, you know, um, the, this woman, you know, in my own mom's generation was that forward thinking and that, you know, um, that liberal and that, you know, accommodating. And I just thought it was such a beautiful thing. So I thought I went from saying, OK, I'm going to have an orphanage to saying, OK, do you know what? I want to adopt a child. So I remember when I was 30, um, all I ever did was work, work, work. So I said to a friend of mine that I think I want to adopt a child. And they said, oh, don't do it. You're a single girl. People think you had a baby outside of wedlock. And I'm like, that's fine. When, when people have had babies outside of wedlock, so their life doesn't end. What's the big deal? They're like, yeah, that's fine. But that's it that happened. But it hasn't happened here. So why do you want to complicate, you know, your, your story by getting, you know, by taking this child? And you always have to explain this child, you know, to people. And anyway, they talked me out of it and said, okay, just wait when you get married. It's even easier to do it as a married couple. So adoption was something that was also on the table for us as a family. However, it was a journey for us, you know, each of these options, IVF, the surrogacy, adoption, all the different options that we considered. It, there was none of it that was an easy option because the easy option is that you get married and you get pregnant and you have a child. Simple. So everything else that was being considered and sometimes felt like you were being considered only because it hadn't happened in the way that normally, naturally, traditionally, it should happen. So I don't want anyone to think that, oh, it's just an easy thing. You just wake up and say, okay, that's it. Tomorrow I'm going to go get a surrogate and that's it. For some people, that might be the case for them. But for other families, it's a journey. Because I remember people would call me and say, Oh, just let me ask, why are you not doing this? And why are you not trying that? And why are you not doing this? And during the journey, I didn't talk to a lot of people about it because I didn't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I didn't want anyone to worry about me. I didn't want anyone to give me desperate advice. I wanted to do, you know, explore all the options available from a very logical and objective place um, and from a place of faith. Absolutely. And I think this is where we need to be mindful um, as people and as women um, who we share our journeys and our stories. We just really make sure that we're not getting influenced by what other people may think. And I think the beauty of this and the reason I, you know, I was really particular um, having this conversation with you is because I know you're one of the very few people that I know that is really open about her journey, sharing her experience. We still do have lots of female who are, I guess, clocking 40 and a bit older and just either not married or things aren't just happening. And I want us to rest on, I guess, the ones that are perhaps maybe not married, but really desire to have children. What would be your advice? And I'm talking about the ones already 40. What would be your advice, knowing what you know now um, versus what it used to be back in the day where it was just frowned upon. You couldn't adopt, you couldn't, um, you couldn't have a surrogate. You just couldn't, you'd have to wait to be married to then have children. What would be your advice to a woman in that situation? I would say go and adopt. <laughs> go and adopt. The reason I would say that is because at the point where you're single, right? You're, you've not been married or never been married. You don't actually know technically 
you may or may not know if there are any fertility issues. I, I believe that children, you know, should come um, as a byproduct of marriage. But the difference between that and adoption is that in the process, in the concept, process of adoption, you're actually given a child a home, a child who ordinarily would not have um, a home. It's the easiest route for a person who is not married to actually go and adopt. If they really want to have children, I would say, I would recommend adoption. I would recommend adoption in the first instance. I would do that. In the first instance. And yeah. I mean, I totally, I totally agree with you because I think it's less intrusive. It less it's intrusive. again, given back to the community, given another child an opportunity where they can hopefully grow, thrive and be, be a better version of who, who they should be. Thank you so much, Uche. It's, it's really been, I think for me, it's always mind blowing each time I hear your story, each time I hear, you know, how you, sh the passion and just the drive. And, and I guess my question for you is what next for you? I know you did talk about, um, you've always desired to have an orphanage home. What's next for Uche in this journey? You know, you've got years of experience. What are you looking to then take out of this, I guess, to give back? to the community? Should we expect an orphanage home? Should we, should we expect something? So <laughs> um, what, I, what I started to do, um, I think about, I think three years ago, um, I actually have um, a group called Gravida. Um, so, and Gravida basically means pregnant and it's um, just women who are trusting, you know, waiting on, waiting to have children. Um, and we, we pray, we share resources, we share information, we encourage each other. Um, and we have meetings every Saturday evening. So that's already happening. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, it's, it's an empowerment group um, because in the group you'd find people that have been married for, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years and dealing with the same thing. So you can sort of share stories in a safe place and you, you know exactly what to say to the person because you've been through that journey. So you don't say the wrong things that end up hurting yeah. the person. So I'm already doing that. Um, and I've been totally blessed by it. You know, just sharing, you know, openly about my journey and sharing, you know, encouraging people. And because I always had the grace to deal with this, you know, I, I was never one of those people that you look at and feel sorry for me because it hadn't happened. So I'm, I've used that as an opportunity opportunity to also um, impact other people and just um, help them work out um, their feelings through the journey. Um, with regards to having an orphanage, um, I actually do have um, two of my closest friends and they already um, own an orphanage. So I just felt, you know what, there's no point having another orphanage. Why don't we all just pull our resources together and help where we can? So what I do is as much as I can, um, I'm trying to contribute to what they are doing already. And I want to get more involved, um, actually. I want to get more actively involved in the work that they are doing um, since um, I don't actually um, have an immediate plan to do to set up the orphanage. However, um, I'm one of those people that um, I just I respond to instructions. <laughs> so <laughs> if, don't be surprised if a year from now, um, I tell you that on second thoughts, I need to actually contribute that orphanage. But for now, I'm already supporting, I support existing orphanages. Um, they're doing exactly the same thing I would like to do. So you know, might as well um, give mm -hmm. them all the support and beef up what they're doing. Um, and then I'm running the, the ministry. And then I just continue to speak out to women um, as much as possible. And I just tell, you know, I just say the same thing to every woman who's waiting or every family that is waiting. Um, there are options available um, and it'll be worthwhile considering those options. Um, and, and I say it from a place of love, having been through that journey. I don't say it from a place of what are you doing? You're just sitting around doing nothing. You know, go, mm. go sort yourself out. But just, you know, educating them about um, the options that are available to them as a family. And there's one thing that I've actually found out because I do have friends who have done every single option. So every option that we mentioned here, I know someone who has done surrogacy, IVF, adoption, name it, every single available option. And there's one thing that is, remains the same. The feeling when you carry that child in your arms is exactly the same feeling as a woman who gave birth to a child biologically exactly the same feeling wow this is amazing 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 and i like the fact that we are ending on that note the feeling you have regardless of whether or not it's a child you have given birth to or whether or not it's a surrogate child or an adopted child is exactly the same feeling thank you so much uche for joining me today thank you thank you so much guys i hope that you have been blessed and you've been able to pick something from what Uche has really shared with us today. 
there's been so much and we know that women are still going through real challenges when it comes to journey to motherhood. That's it for us on today's episode. 